Okay, why don't we just start and uh, tell me a little bit about where you were born, uh, what it was like. Okay, uh, I was born in San Antonio, Texas, uh, May 1st, 1946. Este, I was uh, in the west side of San Antonio, which is uh, the barrio now, one of the poorest, still one of the poorest barrios in San Antonio, in the Edgewood Independent School District. And I went to school, split it between San Antonio and Defiance, Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, uh, Auburn, Indiana, uh, Snyder, Texas. In other words, we were migrants. <laughs> so uh, we every time from about April to January, we hit the migrant route. And usually, we, mostly we went up to Michigan and, and Indiana. And there were, you know, I've always looked back on him as some of the happiest, fondest memories of my life, even though, you know, when you look at it, you know, they were very, we were very poor, and, but the other thing that I, that I, I myself personally, I tell my family I still liked was that we were all like a, all, we were six brothers and, and one sister, so uh, when we traveled, there was usually only two bedrooms or one bedroom, <laughs> so we had to all sleep together, so I grew up at like three to or four to a bed, <clears throat> even though we would sleep lengthwise, uh, crosswise instead of lengthwise. So as you were growing up, uh, what did your parents do? Uh, like I said, my father was a carpenter by profession. Uh, but uh, in the 40s and 50s, you know, there wasn't really that much work for him. He would kind of seasonal kind of thing. So in 1948, when I was two years old, that's when he decided to, you know, hit the try our luck in, as migrants. And we went from 1948 all the way to 1960. 61 as a family, you know, what was left of it. And then I myself went back in 63 by myself uh, to buy a car. I went and worked out in, 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 in uh, Auburn, Indiana. No, I'm sorry, Auburn, uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana. And spent a summer, most of the summer, and came back with a 1953 Mercury. <laughs> came back to San Antonio? With a 1953 Mercury. And your, that was my first car. Continue to... Uh... No, uh, by then my, my family had already stopped, uh, but in 1963, uh, well, not actually, it was, oh, it's, yeah, 63, when we went down there to, to, to Fort Wayne. I had family, I mean, cousins that were out there. So me and uh, my cousin Vicente Guerrero, who now passed away, uh, we were both about, I think he, I was 17, 16, he was 17, something. Anyway, we were, we took the bus and went down there and stayed the summer and bought a car. Did you, uh, at what point did you start working on the farm? Uh, you know, uh, I guess uh, I started working almost from the time I was two or three years old from what my mother can tell us. Uh, like I said, it was all like a family unit, even though I, I wasn't getting paid by the hour, but like I say, when you're picking cotton, you know, we would go in front of my father and my mother, and we would pick us a bunches of cotton so that when they would get there, they would be able to put it in the bag. And uh, I remember basically sleeping, you know, on the surcos, the rows of, you know, out in the, in the fields. And like I said, to me, you know, uh, it was interesting. That's when I started seeing a lot of, you know, what I felt, you know, I guess discrimination, because in San Antonio, when it's all Mexicanos in my barrio, you know, so we, hablábamos todos español. We all spoke Spanish and in school. They stopped us. It seemed like everybody, you know, we're always getting punished for speaking Spanish, but uh, este, it seems that the more they try to stop us, the less they could because the more we do it. Now they don't stop us from speaking Spanish, and hardly anybody speaks Spanish. <laughs> it's young kids, I'm saying, you know, like it seems like maybe I tell them, maybe they had to tell them not to speak Spanish so that they'll want to speak Spanish. <laughs> Would you be in school? Uh, well, that's what was the sad part about it. Uh, my father would get us out of school like early April, because we had to be in Michigan to be in the in the uh, uh, it was sugar beets. You know, we had to go clean and so on sugar beets. So we had to be out there most of April and May, and then June we would go to Michigan. I mean, up, well, we're in Michigan. We would be up to Traverse City. Uh, in July for the cherry and things like that. I was best force of July. 
I remember Fourth of July in Traverse City, Michigan. So, uh, in school, uh, some I had, you know, uh, in, typical. You know, you always since you're a new kid. Not only I guess because I was a Chicano, but because I was a new kid in the school. I mean, I always had, a, you know, it was took a little while to get adjusted to it. So, not that I'm a mean person, but uh, I kind of took it out physically with. I used to get in a lot of fights, you know, at the beginning of schools. I would always have, you know, one or two fights that kind of had to prove yourself and put people, you know, hey, I'm not going to put up with the crap. So I had, you know, some, some interesting experiences uh, during that time. And that was all the way up to junior high uh, in Snyder, Texas. Uh, and then the rest was in San Antonio where... But it was April, and then we would stay out, and I would go back to school in January. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, that's my schooling. And it was interesting because when we would come back to Texas, when we would leave and come back to Texas, uh, when I didn't go to school, in other words, when I went to school, school we stayed over there. Because we would stay one year and come back and so on. But, you know, most of the time we would leave, and the teachers would, I, you know, I didn't understand why, but they would get all upset, you know, oh, here's all that, because... Half the school would leave. <laughs> I mean, come April, May, I mean, the migrants, you could tell uh, San Antonio, the west side, half of it was gone. Mm -hmm. uh, I got to remind people, I guess back in the 60s, 90% of us could relate to a, being a migrant because either you had a relative, an uncle, an aunt, or somebody. everybody was a migrant back then, up to the 60s, maybe even as high as the 70s. And, um, and I do remember that at least 50% of the student population would leave around our time. And, you know, you could see the trucks and fixing up the trucks and people loading up and, you know, getting their caravans and what, all over, you know, the west side of San Antonio. And uh, we would come back and, I, oh, boy, <laughs> then they would get more upset because here we're starting the school year in January and, you know, we're... Oh, the, I remember, you know, they would take it, oh, the teacher would refuse to, and then I'd have to go to the principal. And here's an eight-, nine-, ten-year-old kid, you know, being bounced around because the teacher didn't want to get any more migrant kids because, you know, I, you know we, were, we had to catch up. You know, we were behind. And that also created a stigma within Chicanos, you know, as migrants because uh, when I was, you know, you would come back and the, the classes were kind of divided where, like, the A side, which is the people that were or smarter or advanced, and the B side, which was all the newcomers and the people that were slow, they didn't have special ed back then, but all the slow people would be on, they would divide the room in half, and half would be the, so all the migrants would be thrown right away into <laughs> the slower group. And that always, you know, made me feel bad because the other kids would look down on us and the other kids would, you know, kind of make us feel bad. Uh, and you'd, I, you'd all be in the same class. We would all be in the same teacher. with one teacher, yeah. right? I so I can understand why the teachers were having problems, you know. But uh, back then, you know, well, I, I didn't understand. You would see a lot of kids crying, and you know, it, it was just a, a chaos, you know. When we hit, hit back, was, you know, kids didn't know, didn't want to go to school, and the teachers didn't want it. <laughs> you know, the principals, you know, they have to be the set, you know, take it, you know. It was kind of interesting back then. But uh, when I like, I mean, in a way. Uh, it made me, in that short time, uh, I usually, in two weeks, I, they would move me from the B side to the A side. You know, I'm, I would, you know, just catch up in two weeks, you know, because to me, it was just trying to get out of this side so that they wouldn't look down on me or they wouldn't, you know, because they saw us not only as, aside from being poor, but being stupid and being, you know, it was kind of a bad stigma that they kind of put on uh, at that time on, on all these kids that were coming back. Now, in my case, when I got out of the, <laughs> a high school, I got drafted. But when I got drafted, you know, I, had, I, I wasn't encouraged to go to, to school, so I didn't know anything about going to, uh, to uh, college. So I looked at the possibility of going to a local uh, St. Phillips there, and that was it. I was thinking, you know, I was kind of like, well, am I going to go? Should I take off? Should I stay? What am I going to do? So anyway... I went to this, it's a, it was mostly a black college, uh, St. Phillips, so I remember the counselor there kind of signed me up and, and basically told me, you know, like, to stay in school. And when I got the draft notice, I went, because, you know, after you get your physical and I passed everything. And, and when I got out of high school, I remember I, I, I did a, even though I'm not a, uh, you know, I wasn't too smart, you know, my 
grades are always bad even now. <laughs> you know, next from A, you know, alphabet, you know, A all the way down. <laughs> but uh, my IQ, uh, you know, when I, they tested me back in the 60s, I came out with 142 IQ on the Mensa. And, uh, and back then they were doing some kind of uh, IQs in, in uh, when you got out of high school. My IQ when I came out of high school was 127 or 100, you know, because uh, it was interesting. I thought I had to take all remedial classes, and you know, because of my ACT score also was very high. I had the Navy, the Army, <laughs> everybody. You know, hey man, you can get OCS. You know, Officer Cadet School. You can go to. <laughs> so I was going, should I? You know, but my brother, who had been in uh, uh, Mauricio, had been in Germany, had been in the military. He told me, brother, the military is not for you. You will not survive. Meaning, because you know, I'm, I can't take orders. I'm used to you know, very rebellious against orders, following policies and stuff. So he says, you would be, like, you'd be in stockade most of the time. He spent a year in stockade. So he said, you'd probably spend more time than I would up there. So he didn't encourage me on the, on the military. But, you know, I, I was doing So I showed up at the, at, the, at the draft board, and I told him, you know, they said, okay, <laughs> what do you want to do? But I had also signed up. They had signed me up. I said, well, I said, well you have a uh, student deferment if you want it or, like, there's the bus, <laughs> to get on it or, you know, go to school. So I remember I looked and I, you know what, I think I'm going to go to school. So I went to St. Philip. And then uh, I got married. Uh, my girlfriend, my, who came up, my wife, my first wife, Josie Gutierrez, and I dropped out of school. I went to school one year and then I dropped out. And as soon as I dropped out, boom, <laughs> I get drafted again. <laughs> Uh, I had kind of dabbled a little bit in acting and in school, you know, not that I was an actor, I never really studied acting, but for whatever reason, they, were, you know, I was picked, literally, you know, the English teacher, you know, went and I want you to be in the senior play, you know, and okay, you know, when I was in junior high, you know, they made me be Joseph in a play, you know, and uh, so, I mean, not that I was participating in, in, in a thespian in any way, but I, for whatever reason, I was a little around the acting. and. So, but I was not really into acting. I was just curious more than anything else. And then, so when I came and I got a little, saw a little taste of Hollywood, you know, and, and really, really I'll talk about walking around and, and seeing the difference and everything. And wow, you know. So when I went back, uh, I don't know, some a couple of people say, hey, maybe you should go and try acting. So without any experience or whatever, in 60, 68, when I went back, and then 69, I was, you know, I got, I went to, uh, Texas A&M for a summer, uh, and then I became a driver ed student, and I decided to go to school here, uh, and I came down in late 69, early, well, I guess it was the summer of 69, let's see, 70, I, I'm, I have to double check on it, but uh, I need to look at my transcript, <laughs> and I'll tell you when, but I think I went to school in 70 in, in East L.A. City College, so it must have been about 69 that I had come down, looked for a job, and then I moved my family, my wife and my little girl down here, and we lived in Rosemead, close to my aunt's house, in my house El Monte, in a little trailer. And I happened to be here, when was that big earthquake you all had here, 71, 72? 71, I think, the big one that, well, I mean, the big one before, and I remember everything shook that, you know, we lived in a little trailer, and I mean, the little trailer was going, it hit in the morning, whereas my wife was getting ready to go to work. Uh, she worked at a hospital, and I was going to go to East L.A. City College. And I was, we just woke up, and I remember that earthquake hit us, and I was going from one end to the other to open the door to look out. I thought somebody was outside <laughs> moving my trailer. And then when I opened the door, you know, like, I remember seeing, like, somebody was shaking the rug. <laughs> and I said, oh, boy. <laughs> and then, sure enough, you know, it had, had, a, it had an earthquake. So uh, that's why, I re that's when I was here at, at they go into uh, East LA City College. And so I started, you know, I got an agent, you know, I got lucky. I don't know if you ever uh, heard of Carlos Alvarado, but uh, supposedly he, uh, he was like a pioneer. Uh, uh, Carlos Alvarado is a, as an agent. Um, he's the one that Ricardo Montalban and a lot of people, you know, uh, for whatever reasons, you know, being without, like I said, I never had any training in, in actually in, in, in theater. So I, I 
you know, ended up with an agent. I ended up getting a little, uh, like, kind of like a scholarship with uh, Nosotros, which uh, Ricardo Montalban had already started. I remember it was off Sunset. There was a studio out here by Sunset. And, you know, I, I took some classes there with uh, some people. And real good. He brought good, good professors and whatever you. And theater people that, you know, probably were very important. I don't recall anymore who they were, but supposedly they were, you know, real, real, real good people that uh, uh, Ricardo Montalban was getting. And he's the one, that, actually, he's the one that got me the agent because when we were there, you know, they wanted to make sure we got a good agent and good representation and so on. So uh, with Carlos Alvarado, you know, he sent me to quite a few auditions. I almost got a Brill Cream commercial, <laughs> but I think my teeth, you know, were not perfect enough for them. <laughs> so, but I remember I made it all the way to, you know, less cut, you know, but uh, they, at the time they liked that they were real white and everything, but like I said, I think that they were crooked, you know, so they didn't, I didn't, I didn't get that Brill Cream commercial, but uh, the, I remember Carlos was already getting me, wanting me to get my, my, my union card, you know, my Screen Actors Guild card. Back then, I think it was like $300, you know, for, if, you know, for me to get. He was pretty sure I was going to get it. It didn't work out, but then uh, later on, I, I got a, an opportunity to try out for this movie with John Wayne. I think it was one of his last movies with John Wayne. And uh, I, I got the interview, and uh, that's when Carlos was saying, Efrain, you know, like, you know, you have to get your card because they had offered me, the, uh, according to him, I got the part. But uh, that's when I, I, I don't know, I burned another bridge like I tr usually do. Uh, I remember the director after my, I think it was a third reading or something, but uh, uh, it was kind of a long story. But they liked, supposedly they liked me for the character, but uh, when I was doing my reading kind of like this, you know, and I remember... The guy comes over and tells me, you know, I had read uh, Yo Soy Joaquin. <laughs> uh, that was my piece that I did for my audition. And they said, you know what, Efrain, uh, you know, we like you, but uh, can you tone it down a little bit? You know, like, uh, you know, we, we I, I guess they didn't know how to tell me, but they basically told me, you know, Mexicans don't act like that. I said, what do you mean? You know, because I had this... <laughs> And I said, well, what do you want? What do you expect? He said, well, you know, we're looking for, uh, you know. And I told him, you know, I think what you want is a younger version of Pedro Gonzalez Gonzalez, which was, to me was a typical uh, stereotype of a, of a very, you know, that always shine John Wayne's boots. You know, if you see a lot of John Wayne's movies, you'll see Pedro Gonzalez, and he's always the flunky. And, you know, I didn't like it because he's kind of stereotyped Mexicanos. So I said, and uh, I said, you know what? You know, I can't do that. So, I don't know, Carlos got a little upset. Mr. Alvarado got a little upset because, you know, he said, hey, fine, you know, that would have been your opening to get in. So, no, I said, you know what, uh, I, I'm going back to Texas. You know, I had headed by then. Uh, and I said, you know, I, but in between there, I had met uh, Emilio, who is the first Chicano on Sesame Street, uh, Emilio Delgado. Uh, Rodriguez Delgado, I think his full name. Uh, Emilio was uh, kind of doing, here in East L.A., he was doing kind of a Chicano teatro. He called it Mexican-American. I forgot the full title. And we were meeting in one of the church theaters, and Emilio was uh, doing commercials. You know, he had a commercial. He had a, a, a TV show, a kid's TV show in 69, I guess, because uh, I think... What's his name? Uh, Sesame started in 69, and he went on board the second year. Not the first year, but the second year. So he went on board in 70. So he had, uh, they picked him out because of the kids' TV show that he was doing. But anyway, uh, he's the one that, that got me into the teatro here in, in, in Los Angeles. And again, I, I was just trying to learn. I wasn't uh, really seeing myself much as an actor. But I, that, I kind of credited him with leading me towards the, Teatro Campesino to Teatro more than anybody else. Because uh, I remember Cesar Chavez uh, and his group were having problems with, that's when uh, Luis Valdez and the Teatro Campesino had joined uh, to help uh, Cesar Chavez uh, organize in the fields and stuff. So I remember Emilio telling us, you know, I'm going to take you all, you know, it was about. 10 young kids that we were, 10, I'm talking about you know, mostly college students, they were attending these workshops with him. 
And Emilio said, you know what, Efraín, and everybody, we're going to go to San Fernando. I think there was a big rally out there in San Fernando Valley. And we were supposed to perform something out there. Uh, they, I forgot what we were rehearsing on at the time. Short skits. But he wanted us to go see Teatro Campesino. I had never even knew who Teatro Campesino was at that time. But when I went there, and we went, I think it was San Fernando, out somewhere. And we got there, and you know, I'm, I'm used to see being out in migrant. I was a migrant myself. I feel, didn't, that didn't. But when I saw Teatro Campesino put on their little, they do their little thing out there, I mean, that's when I was like, oh my God, like, I couldn't believe, you know, how this actors and, and, and this group was just, you know, it moved me, and I said, man, it moved people there, and, you know, and all these people and the support. And I'm going, wow, man, that's what I'm going to do. Chiste was the one, basically the one that came up with the idea. You know, we have this teatro that's been, theater that's been right in the heart of West Side and has been closed. Wouldn't it be nice if we could get it for at least to start showing some things like that? So I don't know who or how we got permission to get in there, but they gave us permission to, to I remember we opened the door, it had been closed like for 10 years or whatever. I mean, there were rats bigger than, than, than cats. <laughs> I mean, it was filthy. I mean, it was, you had, so I remember all our, you know, we're kids, we went in, we cleaned it up, and every time you hear a scream of a girl screaming, ah, I mean, she saw a big rat. Or but anyway, we cleaned it out, and we hooked up some lighting in there, and we had a weekend uh, uh, of Juan Corazon there. And it was a huge success. I mean, you know. Which theater was it? The Guadalupe. Oh, it's the Guadalupe. The Guadalupe Theater, yeah. The, and that's when we all, in the office and all of us, and you say, hey, man, this is ours. You know? We need to take this theater over. This, is, this belongs to us. So, I mean, but again. Is that when it became the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center? It became like a year later. In other words, but that was the spark that started, you know, Gonzalo. Like I said, most of the people that started all this, were basically shut off with the Guadalupe. Uh, Chista, who is, you know, I hate to insult my other friends, but as an example, <laughs> to me, it's like you have an opportunity to have somebody like Siqueiros to be your instructor, your professor, but because you don't agree with his f philosophy or you don't like him personally or whatever reasons, you would rather hire one of his students to be the teacher. You know, uh, to me, they, they did that in Guadalupe, and that's why, you know, for about 20-some years, I never participated with anything with Guadalupe. Uh, I don't mean to rehash, you know, but I'm saying uh, they know. Uh, but the Guadalupe, you know, Sabino, you know, could have been a great, you know, instead of Sabino, and even myself, that I did apply, you know, at the early ages, and they wouldn't even take my application, to, to be a assistant director of the teatro, they hired one of our former students, you know, I'm talking about one of our, that I never really, at the time, you know, gave him much as being a Chicano, you know, uh, actor. And he became, you know, the head of the, and I said, well, n not so much me, but Savino would have been perfect for the, for the artist. You know, this guy would have been, instead of, you know, somebody else, uh, for Neftali, you know, all those radical Chicanos that, that were the ones that were the nucleus of uh, the whole thing. Uh, they saw us, I guess we were too, too radical for, for, for them. And since I guess it makes sense, we probably would still be in very small, <laughs> fighting within ourselves. <laughs> but, you know, they, they, they became a multi-million, you know, uh, non-profit group out there. But uh, I, I, I always felt that, that they, they didn't treat the, the people that, that, you know, uh, not so much that I, we wanted recognition, like, we, well, we were the first one. No, no. But I'm saying... I mean, this was something that, uh, not so much me, but they stayed for about a year really building it up and trying to get, you know, going to the city. And, and then, you know, so Consalfo's people, people and Savino and, and Chista and uh, some of the people that are worth theater, you know, half of them stayed. So they helped make the transition. Well, I mean, I don't know how, because like I said, around that time is when I, I started, you know, getting away from mm -hmm. uh, kind of a dark chapter in my life. But, you know, I, after that, I kind of, got away from it. And when I got away from it, you know, I, I didn't stay that involved. By the time I, I realized, you know, it was already, you know, hey, we got the theater, we got, you know, buildings, you know, oh, well. And then I started seeing all these friends in positions, you know, I said, hey, pretty good. But then to me, the only thing that I, I didn't like was that 
like people like Savino, Neftali, Chista, you know, all these people, you know, have never been, you know, given an opportunity to be part of what they started. But uh, like I said, I try not to get, my brother didn't want me to get too involved, but they started sending t to my cousin, they would send him his, whatever he was, the amount that he was receiving, but they would send him like an, an ounce or two of cocaine. And they would tell him, it was free, like, does anybody, my, nobody wanted, nobody even wanted to look at it. So since my cousin didn't have any use for it, <laughs> so I would take it and I would smoke it with, back then with, smoke and put it in. That's how I started doing cocaine, by putting it with the marijuana before I started snowing. Anyway, so I remember 72, 73. I mean, nobody was doing, no Chicano was doing, but they were giving it away, man. I mean, before it instead of one, two, and then three, and, and that was about all the way to, I guess, it started slowly, but by 74, I think, is when it, 74 was when, I mean, they were really pushing it. I mean, they were literally just, here, we'll charge you for the next one, but you can have this one free. And none of them, my brother and my cousin and uh, this guy, Castro, you know, they, they would laugh at me. They used, to, they used to call me, wow. That was my nickname, wow. Because I said, wow. <laughs> and anyway, uh, he, you know, they would give it to me, but then, before you know it, not even a year had gone by, and man, every one of them was hooked. And then they were doing like an, an ounce every two days and things like that. And then by the time I did Please Don't Bury Me Alive, I mean, that's why you show a lot of it. I mean, they had like, I mean, then heroin was, was like, by the mid-70s, you know, it was equal to, the demand was to, cocaine to heroin. And then after that, you know, right now, and like, you know, it's, the cocaine has gone way over in the demand for heroin. And I see it, like I said, it was like they were, they literally, you know, like they say to the blacks that they hook them on. Well, that, you know, they get, okay, that's kind of what they did. And since it was so easy, and I mean, that's when the whole scene that I saw, that I kind of show in, in, in Please Don't Bury Me Alive, you know, that's when it kind of exploded in front of my face in the early 70s. And I got to see it firsthand. Uh, and I got to see also, you know, how bad it affected, and, and that's when the, the, what do you call the conspiracy theory came out in 72, 73, and I think it was done specifically to, uh, a way to arrest as many <laughs> as you can, because see, before you could arrest one person for the crime, but when this conspiracy, I think, came out and it became federal conspiracy that was approved, where they couldn't, just for being, knowing about it, then you could also get involved in it. Mm -hmm. And they almost caught me on that, like, uh, later on, like I said, before being with my brother when he got busted mm -hmm. uh, for conspiracy, and I spent a month in it because of that. So, I mean, I've always felt that uh, that's when they started building prisons, you know, and they, st I mean, now we're a uh, prison economy kind of thing, but, uh, before that, yeah, we had a lot of Chicanos in prison, but they were because they were paying for their crime. After that, instead of one, you're sending five, ten at a time, and they're all going for five, ten years, five, ten years, you know, for minor things, five, little bit heavier, ten years. So, uh, you know, I've always felt that that law was basically done to entrap as many, you know, and I think it's kind of backfired because now, you know, we're paying, you know, it's created more problems, and then, you know, like, well, there's just, you know, I think in Texas, we, we have more people working in prisons, you know, and, and it's costing us more to house prisoners than it is to educate them. And, you know, so the, that whole, but again, back then, I didn't know anything about that. I didn't understand. I mean, I was just, to me, I've always been curious of what's going on, what's going on, what's going on, what's going on. It's like my mind is always recording, recording, recording. I mean, I can go back almost to when I was 18 months old. I can remember as far back that and, and literally see things that, I, that happened at that age. Around this time, we decided that instead of doing something somebody else, we were going to go ahead and make our own movie. Uh, in other words, write our own story. But then as, that was at like 73, I guess, when Savino really got serious about uh, He became the designated writer. 
he was uncomfortable because uh, he was more of a poet. He wrote poems, not really writing. He had like a little book of poems that he had uh, worked on. And by then I had made contacts in Mexico City, so I went to Mexico City and I had worked with this Czechoslovakian, self-exiled Czechoslovakian out of uh, Czechoslovakia, living in, in Mexico City, married to a Mexican lady there, a friend of mine. Uh, and he was a filmmaker in Czechoslovakia and was doing documentaries there in Mexico about witchcraft and things like that. And anyway, he, we, he and I got along real well. And I asked him, you know, what would it take to, to make a movie? So he was very encouraged. And he didn't say, well, you need to. He said, you know what? Man? All you need is a camera and just point it. <laughs> just get the camera and point it at, you know. Make sure you get lighting, you know, you know. But basically, that's what you gotta do. You gotta get the camera and go out there. As long as you got lighting, that's what you need to get. So I ran it, you know, those things, you know, the lights. I mean, I went all out, you know, grand opening oh, and the big, um, uh, in front of the. That's very nice. Yeah, and I mean, I made it like a real professional, you know, uh, premiere. So anyway, the movie goes from Thursday to Monday. That, that was what they gave me. Thursday night it was for the, the premiere screening, and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all the way till the following Thursday, I think is how it worked. So the first day that we were there, uh, we had the Thursday. And again, we packed two showings at night. I mean, the place was packed the, the, at the theater. Thursday night when, for the premiere. But again, when I looked out in the audience, I saw a lot of family and friends. I said, okay, I know they're supporting me, but like the guy told me, if you're going to make your money, it's going to be on the weekend run, Friday through Sunday. I mean, don't expect any money Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I mean, you know, Monday, Friday through Sunday is when you're going to make your money. I said, okay. He said, but it looks good. I said, but to me, I kept thinking, yeah, but there's a lot of friends and relatives. So we made like something like 5,000 or something that night, Thursday night. So I, I remember the Friday night, I told him, I don't want to know anything about the movie until Monday. I was hoping, I said, Monday, I'll go and get my report and I'll see how we did. And you wouldn't go to the theater. I didn't want to go to the theater because, uh, I mean, I said, if, if, if this b blows up in my face, I'm indebted with about, I, I went and hawked like $12,000 in advertisement. I'm, I'm sorry, $8,000 and, and four. $12,000 total I owed, and I had to come up with it, you know, by Monday. That's a lot of money in those days. <laughs> oh, God, you know, to me, <laughs> I used to make $8,000 a year. <laughs> so, you know, and I'm going, okay. So I remember I told my girlfriend at the time, and hey, everybody's, I said, I don't want to talk to anybody. I just, I bought a bottle of scotch. I'm not much of a drinker, but I bought a bottle of scotch, and I started like around 12 o'clock. And I was trying to clear my mind. I didn't want to hear about it. I didn't want to talk about it. I'm drinking my scotch. I drank about half of the scotch. And about 5 o'clock or so, you know, the manager from the, who I had met at the uh, theater called and told my girlfriend, you know, he has to. And now called again. And then my girlfriend said, you know what? He says there's something that you, you have to go take care of, some paperwork. And he needs to see you this before he leaves. So you're going to have to go down to the theater. I said, OK. So I, we, I had a little Honda. <laughs> the Honda was, you know, those little, I think it was a 68 Honda. They were about the size of a Volkswagen. Honda Civic. Honda Civic. Those, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're the size of a Volkswagen. Yeah, 68, that was what I was driving at the time. So I drove, you know, uh, and the parking lot was full. I got there, like, pretty close to 6 o'clock. And the parking lot was full, but to me, you know, I had to park a long ways out. And I get off and I'm walking, oh, what am I, you know, and I didn't want to see, I mean, you know, all these things going, I'm still nervous about facing the creditors Monday. But when, as I start getting close, I see that there was a line of people around the theater. But there was Superman and all the President's Men and I forgot, you know, big movies that were 76 releases. So, I mean, I just automatically assume, you know, there was a four screen theater, so I just assumed that it was the... Hollywood movies that were doing that, not, not my film. So anyway, as I'm walking and I get closer, I start seeing that everybody that was in line were all Mexican, Chicanos like myself. So I said, could it be? So I started running and running and running. And I, I ran all the way and I get to the front and I see that the row, I mean, the people are lined up 
waiting to get in to see, please don't bury me alive. I go, wow. And I walk in, I go to the manager, the manager, I say, what, what's the, what? He says, no. He says, I knew you wouldn't come down. Your girlfriend told me you weren't going to come down, so I had to get you down here just so you could see. He says, come here. He opens the door. And, it, you know, but it was like 420 or whatever there was. It was packed. And, you know, you heard people laughing and things. And he goes, Ephraim, you know, I've been in the business for a long time. He says, you had, it's, it was every two hours, started at 12 Friday. He says, at 12, for the first screening, you had 58 people. For the second screening, you had 180 or something like that. For the, that was two. At the four, it sold out at four. He said, all those people are waiting for the, as soon as these people get out, you know, when the movie was towards the end, at 6 o'clock. So it just sold out, sold out. Wow. <laughs> so anyway, I still, you know, but when I saw there was, you know, I covered it. It was, we made 28, I think, thousand dollars the first week, 27 something, $28,000. So, you know, hey, good. And Santico said, hey, friend, let's go 50 feet. I said, no, no, no. We're going to stay with this three-week sliding scale. Yeah. And I think we got something like 80-some thousand dollars for, no, I, I, no, I take it back. It was 40-some thousand dollars for that theater alone. And then Santico took it, because uh, he had drive-ins, and he put it at two drive-ins and put it at the downtown theater, the Texas theater downtown. So, you know, we kind of, we made almost 90000 back then in about, about a three weeks, four-week run. Well, three weeks there, but altogether, I guess it was a month run. So, I mean, and not only that, it started getting word out, and I started getting, you know, asked to be in a talk show, and, and I ended up being on this talk show, uh, in a, a noon show, and I had gone on a radio show, and I had gone, uh, this was the second one, but it was a, a TV, and I finished my 10, 15 little interview at the end, so when I was, as soon as it was over, you know, I, I turned to leave, and they said, no, you can't leave. I said, why? And the guy says, look at this. You know, that the board was just blinking and everybody wanted information. And they had saved names. This guy wants to talk to you. This guy wants to talk to you. This guy's a theater owner. And so from there, I had two theaters that one from, which is on the border town. The first one that called me from there was in Del Rio. And the guy, he says, I had heard about your movie. We didn't know who to contact. People have been asking, when is that movie coming over here? Another guy up in another little town close to Laredo had also called and said, so I said, sure, I'll go down there. And we kind of went on a haphazard tour. I mean, I would go 150 miles, and then I would go all the way to El Paso, which is like almost 800 miles, and then I would come back to another little town, you know. <laughs> I mean, we were just going wherever the demand was, you know, because we had no plan of, you know, but uh, we had one movie. I mean, we, we ended up with three, three prints. And with those three prints, eventually we ended up to six prints, I think. But we started with two and then three and then six prints. But, uh, I mean, we went like a little caravan. We went here and there. And, I mean, and it was just people just went crazy over it, you know. Uh, you know, and I, I tell people a lot of it, I think it was because it was the first time that Chicanos or they saw themselves on the screen, you know, uh, brown face up on the silver screen. And I think that had a lot to do with it myself. So in 78, uh, I tried this big concert and I had been uh, MC in what was called uh, La Onda Chicana concert that's also as part of the, uh, as this restoration. And when I saw this, it was 1976, the bicentennial of July the 4th, 1976, in Port La Vaca, in Texas, over by Corpus. And it was an outdoor field, and we had all the top bands at the time. And I was the MC, and I took uh, Jack Landman and some of the students from Trinity. And uh, this was in 76, so it was after I, I had money. So we did a real good sh shoot, uh, I think, except that our camera broke, so we only got to get four bands, so we got four songs, one from each band. And uh, I liked it. I mean, I really got the, the music, the Chicano music. Uh, I got to meet a lot of the uh, big band, kind of the leaders of the, of the music scene at the time. And they all liked me, too, so I thought that that idea was real good 
But I said, I want to do this like a Chicano Woodstock. I want to do uh, the biggest outdoor Chicano concert that has ever, you know, ever even thought about. So I went and rented uh, in San Antonio the following year. That was in 76. So in 77, I rented uh, this uh, big 250-acre outdoor. They had, it had been done for, for rock concerts kind of thing. It had a big stage, you know, six feet off the ground, and we put two bands. One would be setting up and everything, and that would be playing. And then at the end of the hour, this one would shut down, and the other would be on. It just kept going nonstop. Uh, I paid fifteen hundred dollars for just the sound equipment to to set it up for me, and so the bands wouldn't really have to just aside from their instruments. So we, I mean, I went all over. I came to California, Arizona, all over Texas, being interviewed, trying to get as much publicity. I got bands for like a band from California show up. I got from New Mexico, from Arizona. I, mean, I had band aside from a lot of bands from Texas. So we ended up with like the best of the Chicano musicians at the time. And we had 72 bands, so we went 72 hours. We had more than 72 bands, but that's just how we went, and we ended up with 72 bands performing. And we started September the uh, Thursday, which was September uh, the 15th, and we ran all the way till Monday. So it was, uh, I think, 72 hours altogether. People can't, like in Yeah, it was, yeah, but, but the thing is, w we were very optimistic, but when we started the 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 the, the whole thing, just again, f you know, just caved in on us. We had the FBI there harassing. We had the, the sheriff department. Uh, we had the highway patrol. We had uh, the security, the sheriffs. I mean, every, the word started getting out that it was going to be violence. That there was going to be drugs, and I mean. So it kind of scared the people in, in San Antonio. I had more people come in from out of state even. I had people from California, New Mexico, Indiana, Ohio. You know, not a lot, but I'm saying like, I think the most, biggest crowd we drew was like a couple of hundred in one of the nights. Uh, but throughout the whole event, let's say about 50% were from out of state. So, you know, in a way it showed me something, but the other thing, you know, I was financially, it was a disaster. And, uh, the the whole thing, you know, just, uh, I mean, I felt like we had, or, you know, I didn't understand why, you know, the media had done that to me. And then I had a, a reporter from the Washington Post and a reporter, two reporters, one from San Antonio, and I forgot the other one was one. But there was three reporters, you know, and at the beginning, and there was nobody there. And, you know, hey, wait a minute, what happened? Nobody's showing up. We expected a line of cars. We had people waiting to park cars, and we had mowed fields, you know, where they could park, and we had some stands and what have you, and nothing. I mean, we had all the music. Musicians were showing up and everything, but no people. I said, wow. So then uh, that was uh, Thursday night. I mean, we had a decent crowd, but that was a lot of musicians, and it was the open night. But I said, okay, we didn't have a big crowd. Friday, we're going to have the people show up. We expected nothing to show up, so... Finally, a, a DPS car comes in, and the department, uh, DPS, uh, what is that? Department of Public Safety, which is like the Highway Patrol kind of uh -huh. DPS. And this guy, this car, you know, DPS car drives in. And so I thought, oh, here comes no problem, because they had arrested my brother for selling a beer to, because we didn't have, they had pulled our license at the last day. Mm -hmm. I mean, they took, I mean, it, it, that's where you expect to make money, and then they pull our license, so then, my brother wasn't ready to make money, but somebody asked him, he said, I can't sell it to you, but I'll give it to you for the, what it cost me. So he, when that happened, I think it was an undercover. So they went and arrested my brother on Friday morning. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it was just, so they said, you know what, Efrain, the thing that uh, we, we had heard about it, and it was a guy from the Washington Post, and the guy that now runs the Texas Monthly was there, Patochik. And that's the other reporter that was there. And they told me, you know what? I don't think it's going to work because my understanding is that the politics in, are involved in it. They don't want to see a, a large group of uh, Chicanos go, join together, get together, because around that time they had just uh, kind of killed the Raso Unida, which was a political party that, that had been a threat to the Democrats and Republicans in, in Texas. Uh, and 
they said now that they, that they were trying to stop the Chicano move on the movement and what have you, they said, so there's no way that they're going to allow you to have, you know, we expected like 30 to 50,000 people there. And they said, there's no way in the world that they would allow that many Chicanos because they would be, you know, threatening to, to the political system. So, I mean, you're not going to get it. And sure enough, you know. So anyway, I flopped. Uh, I lost about pretty close to 20,000 altogether in that venture. And I said, you know what? I didn't do anything. I said, oh, man, do you know this guy? And they started giving all this. I said, no. Look at him again. I said, I don't know him. Look at him again. Well, I might know him. They said, yes, you know him. Boom, they stick at this black and white, you know, and I'm pictured, you know. I said, yeah, but that's at a club, man, you know. Or, and they had pictures of me from California. I mean, because I, I told them, I was, I've only been, they said, I know, we know. You've been back. You were in Modesto. You were boom, boom. I'm going, damn. That's when I got scared. I said, oh, this is, I mean, this is ridiculous. I mean, I was in California, and these people already had a tail on me out there. And I'm busted here. I said, oh, my God. So I just denied. I kept saying no. And they said, no, look, man, we'll let you go. We'll let your brother go. All you got to do is come and, you know, bring us some information later on. I said, no, nah, you know, one, I don't know anybody. They said, yes, you do. I said, well, yeah, I know that guy now, but I don't know him real well. But, hey, wait a minute. You showed me all these bad people. Why didn't you show me about the, I know priests, you know, I know politicians, I know teachers. You know, where are those people? You know, you're you bringing all these bad people. <laughs> anyway, so they said, no. So they Locked me up, took me to the county jail. I signed some autographs when I was there. They kind of gave to two female guards that recognized me because they found out. And the guy just booked me. He says, well, just like the movie. I said, oh, I hope not because the movie, the guy got 10 years, man. I don't want It's all a mistake. It's all a mistake. I'll be out by the morning. He says, well, man, I sure hope so. But it looks, the report is, I said, no, but it's all going to be cleared up. I had nothing to do with it. Anyway, they... My bond is at three hundred thousand dollars, you know. I'm going, oh my God! So I'm there in, in the county jail, and there's this other uh, friend of mine that tried to get me out, uh, Julie Marquez, and she was a lawyer, but she didn't have federal. But she told me, Efrain, I can't represent you because I don't have federal license, whatever. And then this state representative, Matt Garcia, a friend of my brother, came in and represented us, and he told me, you're going to get out, you know. They have, you know. So, okay, the first day goes by and I don't get out. When am I going to get out? Second day goes out and I don't get out. Third day, so he finally, the third or fourth day, he comes visit me and says, Efrain, this is basically how they do it. You know, they, these are the cases. They put yours in the bottom. <laughs> so it's going to take a while. I mean, you ain't going to get out tomorrow. You're going to, I mean, we still have to go for a bond reduction first because, you know, we couldn't pay $300,000. And they're going to, but it's going to take at least a week before we get the bond reduced. So, a week goes by, nothing, two weeks. I mean, at a month, I thought, oh, man. And everybody's telling me, oh, you're doing 15. You know, and I'm going, oh, <laughs> why? You know, I didn't do nothing. And, and I'm claustrophobic, you know. And they put me, my brother's big, you know, bald, six, no, but six foot. He looks bigger than six foot, you know, real mean looking mustache. I look like, I weighed about 130, 40 pounds. And uh, back then, I looked like a little punk. Instead of putting me with, you know, they put my brother with the trustees, and he's the one <laughs> that was carried. And me, they throw me in with all the murders, and you know, in the big cell. And I go, man, these people are a bunch of a-holes. And they wanted to beat me up in jail, you know, and because uh, I changed my name. I told my name was Abraham. I used my brother had passed away. I'm Abraham Gutierrez. Why are you here? Oh no, I just something minor, you know. And, and I would never talk. So people started resenting that I didn't really, you know, go out there and brag and talk and. So then they started telling me, hey, you better be careful. They're going to jump you. They're going to get you when you get in the shower. When you get... So, man, I, was, I couldn't even sleep. I'm looking over my shoulder, you know, and I'm getting all paranoid. But then one of the big guys that had busted my brother's friend was up, and he sent word down and said, you know, don't mess with this kid. They call me Chavalon, meaning the young kid. Don't mess with that young kid. So then the guy said, who the hell are you, man? You know, you got Johnny Juan Diaz, you know, saying that, you know, we better not touch you. I said, hey, man, well, I, he's a friend of my brother's, you know. So, even, and I would keep it. So, finally, you know, like, I was there, I think I was there a whole week. And I'm going, oh, I hope I get out. You know, the first week I'm going to, and I can't get out. And I had the, thumb, the top bunk, and you look, you know, there's two rows, like, 
so many bunks. I think it was like about 15 or 20 bunks, double bunks, you know, on the sides. And then they have one TV out in the middle. So, and I had gotten in trouble with uh, this short, mean little Mexican guy that was go out for murder. And they told me, don't trust him because, you know, this guy's going to get your nights. We just had words, you know, but then I couldn't even sleep. I would read and stay up at night because I always thought he was going to come. I mean, I had the worst time there uh, still. But I said, okay, I'll get out. Just come down. Just come down. So anyway, a week goes by, and I remember it was a, a Friday night. And I'm there. And I said, okay, well, nobody has, nothing's leaked out. The news hadn't come out. Nothing came out about me in the paper and the radio or nothing. I said, oh, man, I hope I get out before all this crap hits the paper. And I'm sitting there, and it was like a 10 o'clock at night news, a 10 o'clock news, and I'm reading a pocketbook in my bunk. And then all of a sudden, I hear something in Efraín Gutierrez. I turn around and I look, and there's my face looking at me on TV. And they put my face, and they put a syringe, and they put joints under, you know, like, I said, oh, man. <laughs> And as soon as, and it was funny because everybody, you know, we're all looking at the TV, all the, you know, the bunk, and I'm at the end, and they're all like that, and they're all looking at that, and they're like, you just kind of see everybody turn around. <laughs> oh, busted, you know, and they, hey, man, you're the one that did the movie, you're the, but no, how come you didn't tell us? Because it's all a mistake. No, man. <laughs> anyway, I stayed a month in there, and it, it was kind of interesting because. Became friends with. After they, they all treated me well. When I would have visitors, we were in the visitors' room, and the other prisoners, hey, say hi to my mom over here. See, mom, even movie stars come into jail. You know, I, yeah, man, I, it was kind of like, kind of interesting, but at the same time, kind of sad. And but I stayed there a month, and then finally, you know, they, released, they reduced our bond, my bond, to fifty thousand. And then when I went to court, the whole thing was dismissed, dropped everything, but they kept me. But by then, they had already embarrassed me, and they had, oops, this thing stopped. When I was in, in the county jail for a month, uh, I saw, and it really had made an impact on me, uh, the, the drugs problem that was really rampant in our, in our neighborhoods and in our communities. And I saw a lot of drug addicts and the families and, you know, the hardships that everybody goes through when something like that happens. So uh, that's when I started feeling, you know, kind of bad about it, and I I started kind of talking to the different prisoners, the reasons they were going, where they were, why they got there, and so it's kind of like uh, a good opportunity to observe and, and and talk to to the people that, you know, I probably never would have never really seen again, and they probably won't even know or care. But I mean, that's what really hit me, and. So I kind of made a promise to myself that when I would get out, uh, God willing, which I did, and everything would work out, that I would make a film about, uh, you know, well, about the drug problem. And I ended up writing this script called Run Tecato Run, which means run, junkie, run. And it's about a heroin addict and kind of put a little of, of what they do, how they go through the family. and. I mean, it's not a, a real hardcore film or whatever, but junk is, you know, I'm glad to say, you know, even in prisons, they, uh, they still see it. Uh, they've, I've had a lot of prisoners, because I used to send my movies when my brothers were in prison, and then they would tell me, send it to this prison, send it to this prison. So my films were kind of in circulation. I used to joke that I had more fans in prison than I had outside. And in a way, maybe it was kind of true because I still run into prisoners, like I had an ex-brother-in-law that came out of prison about three years ago, and he told me, hey man, you know, I saw your movie and people still talk about, you know, your work in prison. And then I had a, another cousin that just came out, uh, had been in there 20 some years in state prison, and he told me basically the same thing. And, you know, like in the 80s and up to early 90s, uh, I would have people, you know, that because some had been with my brothers and stuff like that. And they would, you know, thank me for the movie. And uh, so I think it did some good for some people. And anyway, so I, I did uh, Run Tecato Run. I, I filmed that movie with about $25,000. And then uh, altogether was like with a blow up, because that one we did blow up uh, to 35, because I shot him all in 16, then blew him up to 35. So that one, uh, the, sec the third one, 
was blown up to 35. And we had modest success with it. But again, right around 79, you know, my, after we had survived that other getting together, uh, and then I came out of, out of jail. And so that put a lot of pressure on, on our being together and the problems. Uh, so jo this is where Josie Foss, my girlfriend, uh, helped me more, though, in this particular film. She uh, did some camera work. And she she was more involved in that. She was the executive producer, and because uh, a lot of people kind of criticize me that I don't give her that much credit in the first film, even though she was involved. But like I remind people, she didn't really care about the first film. She doesn't. She wasn't really that supportive. As a matter of fact, she made an interview and said the only reason she was doing it was because you know she was my girlfriend. Uh, but uh, towards the end, in, in Run to Cut to Run, uh, you know I. I'm anxious to have this film out because I think this is will kind of give credit to a Chicana filmmaker uh, because she she did play a, a bigger role in in, in Run Tecate to Run. But uh, needless to say, I mean, by the time Run Tecate to Run came out, uh, there was just too many problems. Personal, uh, my brothers were in prison. Uh, uh, the whole problem in, in San Antonio, the personal life was going downhill. Uh, so I just decided that uh, I would st step out because uh, by that time, because of the, I had the, the drug problems that they had associated me with, uh, the backers that, that not with a lot of money, but uh, they didn't trust me with, with, uh, with the distribution of it. And since my, wife, my girlfriend and I were splitting up, they had more confidence in her. So I told you, all right, let her take over then and I'll, I'll just drop out. Uh, I made a deal with my girlfriend because she said, I, this town ain't big enough for you. Either you leave or I leave. And if I leave, I take me, I have two little girls with her. So if I leave, you'll never see your girls again. So I said, okay, you know, I'll leave, but just let me have a screening to raise money so I can go to California. And I knew Laredo was a real good one for me because uh, the two movies had done over 15,000 in a week. They run their uh, issue. So... I figured I'd get another 15000 from there and take off to California. But I got to Laredo, and we made 20 some thousand dollars or I made $20,000 that was mine. And I turned everything over to them. And I was going to go to California from there, but uh, I met this lady that's now my wife <laughs> there in Laredo. And so I didn't make it to California. <laughs> I stayed there in, in Laredo for about a year, and then we got married, and I ended up staying there for 20-some years. And I just, after the heart attack, I moved to, I had a heart attack in the year 2000, and I moved to, to San Antonio. But uh, Ron Tecato Ron, uh, I think a lot of parents have told me that they appreciate that film. Uh, uh, music especially, you know, people love the music. This music was done by... Uh, Steve Jordan, most of it, the title song was written by the friend of mine from, from Modesto, California, the Yerba Mala, but uh, he couldn't make it up there, so Steve Jordan ended up uh, doing the, the soundtrack. And a lot of people, Chicanos, think it's one of the best soundtracks that has ever been put together. Uh, little, you know, in, in the Chicano artists, you know, like Lil Joe, Johnny, you name it, you know, they all think that what's named Steve Jordan really did himself, uh, did himself in, in, in this film and the music that he did. Uh, the one before that, Amor Chicanos Para Siempre, also has a lot of music, and that was done by Henry Valderrama and his orchestra, which, again, that movie has beautiful music in there, more of an orchestra love kind of songs. But anyway, so uh, after that, I, I just decided that I would stay in... in in Laredo, I mean, because uh, I liked my girlfriend who turned out to be my wife, and I, I, I decided that I would give up filmmaking, so that was in 79. So I just disappeared off. You know, I stayed in Laredo for almost 20 years, and I kind of put the whole film things behind me, and I never really wanted to dis talk about them. I would go to San Antonio, and my brother would tell me, hey, there's people from New York looking for you, or California. I don't want to talk to you. There's films that I don't want to talk to. I didn't want to talk to anybody. So as years went by, less people started recognizing me. 
And before you know it, I thought everybody had just completely forgotten about what I had done. Uh, that's when I started hear, finding out that people started telling me, hey, you know, they're, they're looking for you this, they want this, they need the UCLA, especially this guy, Sean Noriega, is looking for you. <laughs> I didn't know who Sean was. So anyway, I went to, uh, what was it, in, in, in uh, University of Texas, uh, I got involved with the, with the Zapatistas uh, raising food and stuff to send to the Subcomandante Marcos. And uh, we were, my son and I were kind of the first ones to, to organize in Nuevo Laredo after the massacre in Texas. So we boycotted and you know, did the whole thing that, uh, to stop the massacre. And so through there, my, you know, my face came out in, 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 in uh, a lot of TVs, in not only in, like from Houston, San Antonio. It was kind of picked up because of the news, what we were doing in, in Laredo. And so I started getting people calling, hey, man, you're the guy. So then anyway, the, one of the right hand for Subcomandante Marcos, this friend of mine that uh, I work with, he told me, you know what, I got this friends of mine in, in UT that they have the Chicano, Latino Chicano Film Forum, and they've been looking for you. They would like to, and it was getting close to the 20th anniversary of my first film. That was in 1996. And so we agreed to, to screen it, and then at this film festival, actually, really, uh, in, it's called Cine Sol in South Padre Island. And they were all excited because it, it was going to be the first screening almost in 20 years. But uh, the people that I had said yes, but they never gave me a date where the people in UT cared a little bit of a situation for me, but not real, I felt bad. Because they had pushed it as a, you know, you know, the 20th anniversary in the film festival, and then this guy's in Austin out like a month or three weeks, whatever before. They decided since I had given him permission that they were going to screen it, so they ended up screening it. So you know, I, I don't know if the lady ever was real bothered by it, but I felt real bad. It was not intentional. That you know, it took a lot of because she was building it up as you know, big thing. <laughs> anyway, so. Uh, when I screened it there in the University of Texas at Austin, that was kind of the first screen after almost 20 years. And I had a full packed house at the, at the theater there at the university. And, you know, it felt good. You know, I said, well, people still remember. And then I went to that film festival. And at that film festival, that's when I, I mean, it really blew, my, blew me away because, I mean, they had all the, you know, the film festival, all this Chicano and all these movies. And here I come with an old 20 year old movie. And they show it at like at two o'clock in the afternoon. And but once I got there, the whole buzz it was like, I mean, even the audience, you know, when they after they saw my movie, they wanted me to get an award. I mean, it was just I said, hey, this is an old movie, <laughs> and it was really, it was really. Right, and, and there was, like I said, in 96 when we went to remember Cinesol. And, uh, I mean, the reaction was just awesome. I mean, I'm talking about, it seemed like I had never left, you know. I said, wow, this is interesting. So, and then there's when they told me, hey, there's this guy, Sean Noriega, and they started everybody. I had like about, uh, oh, it's a few, uh, about five, six producers, you know, all around me and some young filmmakers and, I mean, everybody was just like, oh, man, we've been looking for it, we've been looking for it. So it made me feel real good because uh, uh, I had really, I was supposed to screen the movie at the Guadalupe, which is, you know, the oldest Chicano film festival there. They asked me to screen it, and I, I did it. There's a little, you know, my part mostly, I didn't want to associate with it for my own personal reasons. So for 20 years, I also stayed away from them. And I had been one of the first ones that had shown a film in their film festival when they started. And then 20 years, I hadn't even bothered to be with them. And then this guy, Jimmy Mendiola, who's a filmmaker also, was curating or whatever the, the, the festival. And he got me in August to go there, agreed to go there in January. But then I agreed, but then they never sent me you know, the information. And, 
so basically, they let me out. They, ex they said that I was going to be there, but then, and the word leaked out because I myself told people I'm going to be there. So the good thing about it that I felt was uh, they didn't invite me in the end, uh, but the word had gotten out that I was going to be there, and I wasn't there. I wanted to go. I was so mad because I said, man, how insulting. You know, first they tell me, they, and then they didn't. So I was kind of, and, I, and since I know him, I was going to go harass him and scare him or threaten him or, <laughs> you know, do something just, you know, out of anger. But then it got cold. And I, said, I was in Laredo. I said, I'm not going to go down there. Screw it. So, but this, uh, this guy's working on his uh, PhD. He's writing his dissertation about me. He was one of the young kids that was there, and this other guy from Austin. And you know, there was, he said, Efrain, there was at least seven film producers that showed up, and we, just because of you. And we were asking, where's Efrain? Where and they said, oh, uh, we couldn't find him. We, I said, bullshit, man. They, but anyway, and Sean used to, and they never gave him any information about me. So anyway, I'm glad I went to Cinesol, and Cinesol, you know, like I said, that, that was really, really awesome there. And that's when I said, okay, I got this phone number. And that's when Sean says, so I call him and I say, yeah, you're looking for me. And that's how Sean and I connected. And then I found out, you know, who he was and how respected he was in the industry, in the Chicano cinema. And what he, so we became, you know, pretty good friends. And he's the one that kind of told me, well, we need to get your films together. So if it hadn't been for him, I probably would have lost all my films because the first one I, I hadn't seen my friend Hector in, with Yerba Mala in about 15 years, and I had left my, my, my work print there in, in, with him. I mean, my, my only print, 60 millimeter print that I was using up there, I left it with him. And then for, for 15 years, we didn't see each other. And he, I already lost track, and then I couldn't find him. And anyway, so when Sean told me, well, we want the f some of the films, you know, I said, okay, I don't have, but first one, let me go see. Anyway, I went to Modesto, and I got my friend. My friend went up into the attic. <laughs> And there it was. A month after he took it down, his attic burned up. So, you know, if I, if I had been one month late, <laughs> we wouldn't have this film, the first one. And then uh, Amor Chicano, Chon got it out of CFI. I thought it had been lost because they had told me that they didn't have it, that Mexico had taken it. But Chon got it, and, and I agreed to get, release it over here for restoration, so they gave it. And then Run Tecato Run, the last one, uh, we had... Uh, one, two, three, I think it was seven prints. Uh, we lost one, two. I gave one to my ex-girlfriend. I kept one, but I lost it. Uh, I gave one to this uh, Janet Rowe, who was one of my investors, this lady, friend of mine, a nice lady. So anyway, I couldn't, when we didn't make the money, you know, I just told him, you know, I'm, I'm going to be out of it, but here's your movie. <laughs> And talk to her, you all want to distribute whatever you want to do. So I gave 35 millimeter prints out. And the 35 millimeter print went to. Right? Okay, the, uh, to Jesse Galvan. And so when I tried to track it down, the only one that, that I got a hold of that had a print left was Jesse Galvan. But he had had it for like 17 years, and he had it in the, in the attic. I mean, I mean, in the closet. When you walked into a closet, he had like a barrel or something in there. And when you opened the closet, I mean, because I went to his house, I hadn't seen him. I called him, oh, sure, I got it. So I went over and he says, he just, in his living room, he had a big house, but in a closet in the living room. He opened it up and pulled out this rusty, <laughs> you know, because there's those 35 millimeter print cans that are made out of iron and, and all corroded, I mean, well, uh, rust. And, and that's the one that's really damaged because, you know, it, it faded and, got rust and everything. So anyway, I, I was able to salvage those two, uh, and I turned them in over to Sean. And since then, we've you know, we kind of been working together. But uh, basically, that's the story of the three movies. Uh, I've done one more now. Sean knows it, uh, Lowrider Weekend, the year 2000, which was almost 20 years later, I made another movie uh, that's out in Blockbuster, Hollywood videos. And I think it's sold at Best Buy. It's all over. That's the only movie that's out there. It's a comedy with uh, uh, lowriders. And then I'm working on my fifth film. Uh, hopefully I'll start filming in February, and that's uh, Stories from the Barrio. It's a sci-fi with kids, you know. I've made up my mind that I will not do any more drug movies, gang movies, 
my whole thing has been trying to get Chicanos to kind of get away from that stereotype. I think that it's done a lot of damage. And I feel partly responsible because a lot of people kind of see me as the, as the guy that started Chicano cinema, but not only that, I mean, you know, independent filmmaking, but uh, mine dealt with drugs. And everybody that came after me went the drug route. So, I mean, you know, it's the, the, that culture and that, you know, they, they publicize it and they, you know, they glamorize it. And, I mean, we're killing too many people, killing each other. So, anyway, uh, I've been trying to convince most Chicanos to, you know, that it's time we got out of, of you know, promoting drug films and, you know, bad films like that. And hopefully we got so many stories, we don't need to do that. And I, you know, I did this low writers like a comedy to, because I'm beginning to write, so I wrote, uh, I wrote it uh, also. And it's a, it's a, it was funny. I mean, we know it's out there. We know people are seeing it because you know Danny and different people tell me they go all over on this car shows, and and now people tell me they see it at you know uh, Best Buy and all this. They're selling it for seven, ten dollars, whatever. Uh, sad to say. Uh, I haven't made a penny out of it. <laughs> uh, the, the distributor keeps saying that there's no money, there's no money, there's no money, and everybody tells me, "Hey, man!" But you know, it's hard to fight, you know, such a big industry. So I think I'm going to be screwed. The only good thing about it is that, you know, it's gotten me out there again because of that lowrider weekend, and that one, uh, it you know, it's brought a little more opening attention. Some kind, you know, hopefully it'll help me in the next one. But that just basically seems like more publicity. Uh, I we filmed it in the year two thousand, released it in two thousand and one, and it's been on video since two thousand and two. And this, so now we're going to with kids, you know, skateboarding, doing sci-fi, but more family kind of oriented things. What I, I plan to do, hopefully, if I make any more movies, that's what they're not anything relating to to drugs or anything like that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck to your beautiful interview. Oh, thank you. I, I'll stop this right here.